Hello and welcome to this Progressive Government Summit discussion in cooperation with the New Statesman magazine on Germany after Merkel. Um, this is a live event being recorded or being filmed in Berlin and in Washington DC and this will also go out as an episode of the New Statesman's World Review podcast on global affairs so it will also be available there later this week as we record this. So I'm very pleased to be joined for this conversation at a very timely moment by two great commentators and observers of German politics and Germany in the world to talk through this. Um, here with me in Berlin is Michael Miebach, the um, chair and co-founder of Das Progressive Zentrum think tank. Um, he is also a senior advisor in the Bundestag um, and a great person to talk to us about the view from here within German politics. So good to have you here, Michael. Thank you, likewise. And down the line from Washington, we're very pleased to be joined by Constanze Stelzenmüller, who is the Fritz Stern Chair on Germany and Transatlantic Relations at the Center on the United States and Europe at Brookings. Uh, Constanze was formerly at the German Marshall Fund and at Die Zeit. And um, she actually recently wrote uh, an excellent essay on precisely this subject, the, the legacy of Angela Merkel and what, what the future might hold for Germany uh, in foreign affairs. So very good to have her with us. Thank you for joining us, Constanze. Good morning from Washington. Nice to be with you. And can I just say what a very uh, nice set design. Thank well, you I very much. I would say the shorts, Jeremy, are a little bit, um, I, I w I'm about to say, I would say the shorts are a little bit out of place, except would you? that I also am wearing shorts, but you can't see that. <laughs> you see, I, 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 th I thought our camera setup would be the same in Berlin as it is for you in Washington. So uh, nobody really <laughs> needed the sight of my legs that they're getting in this, in this, in this session, but somehow we will have to, uh, we, will, we will muddle through. <laughs> uh, thank you for that. Okay, well, I think let's just get stuck into our conversation and um, let's start by kind of looking at where things have come over the last 16 years, the, the Merkel era in German politics. And I'd love to hear sort of relatively briefly from both of you, how would you rate the Merkel chancellorship in, its, in, in, in the way it has responded to the challenges that Germany has faced over that period? And I think I'll go to you first, Constanza, to kind of give us the, 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 the foreign policy view, the view from, from the outside. And also perhaps you can convey some of the points you made in that excellent essay I mentioned. So uh, over to you for some quick initial thoughts. All right, thank you. Well, thank you very much for, particularly for the plugger um, for my essay. Everybody read it, please. Um, you know, the editors at Foreign Affairs sort of tried quite hard to get me to be a, a little more, you know, to come down on one side or the other on this question. And, and what I do in the essay is to say that that's very hard to do. She... She's not one of these German chancellors who will be remembered for doing one great thing, like Konrad Adenauer with, with Westbundung, um, Willy Brandt uh, for atonement with Eastern Europe and going to his knees in Warsaw, or Helmut Kohl for two great things, really, um, the, uh, the reunification of Germany and the introduction of the Euro. Um, and of course, all these men, and in fact, some of their other uh, peers had some fairly notable flaws. Um, they were womanizers, they were heavy drinkers, they smoked, um, they were, some of them were unreliable after 4 p.m. Um, and Merkel is none of these things. She's, I think, notably uh, devoid of vanity or even a shade of corruption. Um, she has a, a sense of humor, which she occasionally shows to people. Um, but her record is more complicated. I would say she de definitely needs to be credited for making the country uh, wealthier, more powerful in her tenure, for keeping Europe together when it mattered during the Eurozone crisis um, and during the pandemic, which was also a crisis of, of governance and, and of the European economies. And I would also say that, that um, letting in the refugees in 2015 was a great humanitarian gesture, which took huge pressure off uh, the neighboring smaller countries who would have had much greater problems with uh, such a huge amount of refugees. But then many of these, of, of, of her most significant decisions, 
including letting in the refugees. Uh, the, the decision to go out of nuclear energy after the Fukushima disaster. Um, her tolerance of uh, Hungarian um, rebuilding of their, dem of, of, of their constitutional order into an illiberal democracy. Um, all of these things, I think, have to count, you know, they have, have significant ne negative um, aspects, which will, I think, be, uh, be held against her in her record. And, and finally, I think my most serious um, concern is that I feel that she's left Germany essentially unprepared for the future. I'll leave it there. Yeah. Well, that's, that's, that's definitely something I want to come on to. Thank you for that overview. And I'd just like to say, before I come to Michael for his thoughts on this, um, I should have mentioned at the start that we will, of course, be taking questions um, from the audience here. So let us have those, and we will get through them as much as possible once we've con uh, concluded the main part of the conversation. So anyway, with that, Michael, what is your view on Merkel's legacy? How would you rate her chancellorship? Well, I slightly disagree with Constanze. Brilliant essay, by the way. Lo love to read it. And a lot of things uh, you, you write are right. She's a strategic mastermind. She's an upright character. She's uh, been very good on uh, international diplomacy and all those things. But I would like to start with a small little uh, political story because today, 20 years ago, on June 10th, 2001, the red Green Coalition decided, together with the enterprise companies in uh, the the electricity companies in Germany, sorry, to uh, phase out the nuclear power 20 years later. And nine years after that, in 2010, the former environmental minister Angela Merkel, who had then become chancellor, in a conservative liberal coalition decided to postpone this phasing out. Only to a half year later, after Fukushima had happened, to turn back the wheel and to again decide on the phasing out of nuclear power, which has cost the German taxpayer billion, billions. Why am I telling this story? Because I think it tells us something about her leadership style and also about the um, the negative <clears throat> aspects of, <clears throat> of, of her uh, approach, her pol political approach. Um, I would describe her leadership style as wait, moderate and react. So she's not the one like Gerd Schröder in, uh, in his chancellorship that seeks the public sphere, that makes bold proposals that people can argue about, that it public democratic discourse is possible about, but rather she is uh, not communicating at all. And if she's communicating in a very technocratic, complicated way, and uh, this technocratic approach has left Germany, I think, with three challenges or problems. The first is, I know you cannot uh, make her alone responsible for this uh, development, but the rise of populism, I think, has to do with this approach of not explaining policies good enough. So the rise of populism is part of the legacy of Angela Merkel. Secondly, she has left her own party in shatters, if you want to say, put it that way, absolutely alienated uh, from, her, from herself, without orientation and with no program, basically. And therefore, for all parties that will uh, go into a coalition with the Conservative Party in the future, it will be very hard, uh, will be a very hard uh, and problematic partner. And thirdly, and you mentioned that, of course, already, uh, there, there have been a lot of uh, policy fields that um, she just left uh, unexplored. And the, uh, just to mention one, which I think is the, one of the most uh, negative aspects, is the rise of inequality in the last decade. And uh, inequalities, uh, you have to say. So it's not just uh, that the difference between the poor and the rich uh, got stronger, 
stayed the same at least. It's also uh, inequalities between the cities and the rural areas, inequalities between regions, inequalities between generations. And I think this is one big aspect that she just neglected. Yeah. I'd like to move on to the, the situation now, but I think something that bridges what we've just discussed and the, the current picture is this question of how much change and how much sort of radical progress do Germans actually want from their chancellor? And I guess I'd divide that question into how much did they want when Merkel became chancellor and over the years of her chancellorship, and how much do they want now? Are we seeing now this so-called Aufbruchstimmung, this, this mood for change or transformation? Because I think one of the, one of the defences that's sometimes given for Merkel's style of politics is that she is the small-c conservative chancellor of a small-c conservative country. She has remained remarkably popular throughout her time as chancellor. Um, Germans give relatively positive answers on average when asked how satisfied they are with their lives. Um, it is a country that famously values stability and order. And so I suppose I'd like to hear from both of you on that question, both with regards to the time during which Merkel has, has governed, but also as to where we are now. Did or do Germans want more change than they're getting? Constanza, would you like to have a, have a first um, swing at that? Um, first stab. Yeah, well, thank you. Um, you know, I, I, if, I, if I might, I'd also like to respond to Dominic. Um, my sense is honestly that the the chancellor's sort of um, opaque communication style is, of course, part of the way in which she um, deployed power. It was uh, precisely the point to be opaque, because she didn't want to let herself be pinned down. Um, in in that, she's sort of rather like an octopus, you know, uh, deploys a cloud of of inky of inky smoke, and and you know, when the smoke clears, she's somewhere else. Um, Sorry, that's perhaps a slightly disturbing image, but um, I would say the, what she, what what was more important for the rise of populism was, paradoxically, her liberalisation of the CDU, pushing it into triangulating it into the middle, by which, of course, she sque squeezed the Social Democratic Party, um, you know, to the wall, really and left the right wing of the party uncovered politically, something um, previous conservative chancellors had taken great care to avoid, and that left a political vacuum for, for the AFD. That, that strikes me as the more important reason. Now, as for Germans and change, well, um, I would just say, um, in defense of, of my countrymen and women, that people perhaps underestimate a bit just how significant the transformational shocks to Germany have been in the last 30 years. Um, I was just looking this up recently and um, people keep talking about the refugee crisis, the arrival of um, a million plus refugees uh, in, in, a, in a year in, in 2015 and thereafter as, as just a you know unprecedented transformational shock. But between 1988 and 1993, um, there was a net immigration in Germany of 3.4 million. And this was the, 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 beginning, the, the, the beginnings of the dissolution of the Warsaw Pact and the Soviet Union and, of course, the fall of the Berlin Wall. That was extraordinary. And I think that it really is the shock of that era and reunification, both for Western Germany and Eastern Germany, that we have neither fully acknowledged as a country nor certainly fully digested. And then after that, you had the global financial crisis and the Eurozone crisis. Um, you had the refugee crisis. You had the rise of populism. But really, I, I, think it's, I think we need to go back to those 30 years and acknowledge that we haven't been honest with ourselves about just how transformational that was for Germany. So, you know, there's been a lot of change. And actually, in those 30 years, Germany achieved a great deal, but also a lot was left undone. And I think what, what I would like to see future chancellor, chancellors uh, doing differently is, is to indeed, and there, here I am completely on Dominic's side, to speak differently to citizens, to treat them like, like adults. It's, it's Michel. 
I'm sorry, Michelle. What am I saying? What am I saying, Michelle Niebach? Forgive me. Um, that was. Don't worry. Um, I almost it is like still early in the morning, and I'm just having <laughs> exactly. my. I'm just having coffee. Forgive me. <laughs> We're both blonde. Don't worry about it. <laughs> Thank you for catching me, Jeremy. No problem. No it problem. is Jeremy, isn't it? No, but it is, um, <laughs> all right. <laughs> the Look, remember Helmut Kohl saying in, in the early 1990s that there would be blooming landscapes in Eastern Germany and uh, they would be paid for by, by growth. Yeah. The costs of reunification have now been calculated over the past 30 years at about, I think, 20 billion um, astounding sums. And there have been sums for the West, uh, sorry, costs for the West and costs for the East. I tend to think the psychological, social and political costs in the East were greater. Uh, and, the net, and I'm talking about the net costs, not just the total costs. Of course, they had benefits as well. And, and we're seeing those in, you know, in, in the extraordinary st strengths that the populist party, the hard right party, the AFD, still has in the East, as we just saw in last Sunday's election in Sachsen-Anhalt, where they came in at just short of 21%, which is astounding given that that's one of the most rad radical and extreme regional um, divisions of the AFD. I'll stop there. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that the, the points about the, the sheer degree of transformation that Germany's gone through over the, the past 30 years is a really good one. And I mean, certainly in my own analyses of this, it's something that I always try to bring to the, 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 to the question of what Merkel's achieved. Because as you say, Michel, you know, the red-green government pushed through a lot of change. You know, this was the government that managed the, the, the unemployment crisis that in many ways actually had to grapple with the costs of the reunification, as, as, as Constance has mentioned, um, but that also started asking big questions about German identity and about the future of the German economic model and industrial model. And I sort of wonder if, I, I agree with a lot of your criticisms of Merkel, but I wonder if maybe uh, it's worth seeing her as the chancellor who bedded in some of that tumultuous change from the previous certainly the previous eight years or even the previous 15 years um, since, since reunification, you know, how, how, how radical a, a chancellor was Germany really willing to, to have you know, after all of that? But anyway, mm. could we have your thoughts on, I think, particularly the mood in Germany at the moment, because, you know, you're, you're in the Bundestag, you, you're obviously following the debates running up to the election. Do you think there's an Aufbruchstimmung in, in the country? I do, but I'm not 100% sure, to be honest. Um, so the general mood in Germany right now, I would describe uh, along uh, four notions. First one is people are tired. People are relieved because Corona seems to be over. You can go out on the streets again, uh, get some wine, etc. They are insecure about the future about the future of our economy, the future of our state, the social future and so on, but also about Corona itself. What will happen in the fall? Will we get a fourth wave? That's a big issue. And they are also, and, and that's what we measure in the, in the polls, there's, there's coming out of this uh, an, an anger against the government for the big mismanagement that took place in the last months. Vaccines were ordered too little and too late. They, we have two huge scandals about the ma uh, ordering of masks from uh, the conservative uh, health minister and so on. So a big uh, anger about the mismanagement. And th all, this four um, things uh, fuel something I would describe as a wind of change. And Das Progressive Zentrum has published a, a survey on the issue and uh, we ask what kind of leadership style do Germans want at the moment. And almost half of Germans say that the successor of Angela Merkel must be ready for change, must take new paths in a brave way and be assertive. And only 15% say that they are keen of the moderating style of Angela Merkel. So this, and this resonates with another survey by Bertelsmann Stiftung, according to which more than 60% say that uh, they want a new government. That is a very high number and can only be compared to 1998, where you had the, um, uh, the SPD and Greens takeover, and 2005 when Merkel got into power. 
So very high numbers. Um, of course, the question is, what is a new government? And what should a new government do? And if you get, get into details there, it's a little bit more complicated. Very high on the agenda is climate policy, of course, in Germany. But secondly, also still refugee and migra migration. So, um, yeah, and for me the question is, if we assume that there is a momentum for change now, that, that uh, she leaves a void that is an opportunity structure for uh, the other parties, uh, because, you know, the CDU is probably not going to gain from this mood. The CDU will be elected for stability and security. Um, so who's going to profit? It will be the Greens, and they are very uh, historically high in the polls at the moment, more than 20%. The FDP, the Liberal Party, which has positioned itself in the last months as something like a reasonable critique force against the corona measures, um, without being too populist, and is, is also polling very well. And the, the, the really interesting uh, and open question for the left camp will be what happens to the SPD. You know, because the SPD is struggling, has been a junior partner for the second time in a row now uh, of Angela Merkel. And the question is, will they be considered as part of the solution or as part of the problem, as part of the technocratic problem that we have uh, had in the past? And yeah, it's, it all will depend on the campaign in the next three months. One of, the, one of the striking things is that you say that there is this, this, this mood for change, and yet you, get, you look at the polls, for example, recent ones, about the preferred candidates to be chancellor. I don't want to make this just about the horse race, but we are, we are talking about the role of chancellor here. Um, and you have, you know, there is obviously a certain amount of support for Annalena Baerbock, the chancellor candidate of the Greens, although it's come off some of its recent highs in the last week or so. Um, but you still have pretty solid numbers for Armin Laschet, the CDU CSU candidate, and Olaf Scholz, the CSU SPD candidate, and we could debate their merits. Um, but neither of those, to me, s come across as makers of change. You know, Laschet is a very conventional Christian Democrat. He's would govern, we assume, in the Merkel tradition. He's already been head of the biggest German, the most populous German state. So he's not exactly coming out of left field. Uh, and then you have Olaf Scholz, who's literally Merkel's vice chancellor, finance minister. And in some ways, I would argue a bit of an heir to her political style. Certainly, if he if he did end up becoming chancellor, his his sort of he's quite dry. He's he represents stability. So how do we how do we reconcile those two things? I mean, um, I don't know if Constance would like to come in on this, and and perhaps I don't know if we could we could talk a bit about the possible coalitions after the election. But just any thoughts on the 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 mismatch between what sure. seems like a mood for change and candidates that don't necessarily exude that? Yes, uh, I mean, Jeremy, I think you're quite right to point out that paradox. Um, and if we look at Sunday's election in Sachsen-Anhalt, um, and the fact that the popular incumbent minister president, CDU, Rainer Hasselhoff, got votes from every party, um, including Die Linke, which is astounding. Um, then you, I think, can see that there are, you know, the German political landscape does have some surprises up its sleeve. Um, and that, I think, also suggested that people wanted a quantity that they knew, that they thought was reliable and uh, predictable. Um, so I think that that might be a bit of a bellwether for for the national elections. That said, um, according to the surveys that we've been seeing, the political landscape is as fragmented as it's ever been. It's uh, the coalition variables and the coalition maths are just completely wide open. Everything is possible except, I think, I mean, if, if, German, if, if German voters really go for predictability, they will elect a two-way coalition, and that would then be a CDU-Green coalition. But on current 
polling, I think the, the more likely option is a three-way coalition, and that could go in any direction, a, uh, a Germany coalition, a Jamaica coalition, a traffic light coalition, um, and we'll just have to see how that goes. The, 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 you point out very accurately that all of the three candidates who stand a chance of becoming chancellor have attractions and significant downsides, rather like Michael herself. Yeah. And I have to say, I myself am completely torn. I find Annalena Baerbock attractively confident. Um, I think if you want change and if you want a new direction, then she stands for that. But I think that the way that she and her staff have handled the um, revelations, which are relatively minor, of, about her CV, um, are, are actually do undermine confidence in her a little bit. I mean, I, her significant disadvantage is that she has no governance experience whatsoever, which you would kind of want for the anchor economy in, in, in Europe at a time when the role of that anchor economy is likely to be truly crucial, given the sort of quite aggressive interference um, by, uh, by, by China and by Russia. We've just had the uh, German intelligence service heads last week telling us that interference by, by these two was on levels not seen since the Cold War. And uh, honestly, L Laschet, whom I went to law school with in Bonn in the, in the, in the first half of the 80s, appears to be a decent and and supremely predictable kind of man but i i find the way in which he sort of deals with questions of foreign policy the question of what needs to change um personally rather off-putting because he he doesn't seem to see that the strategic landscape around germany really has changed quite starkly and and that we may need a a much um, clearer realignment than what he seems to be proposing, which is what Germans would call Weitersor, and in English or rather Latin is the status quo. Um, and then finally, you've got with Olaf, Olaf Scholz, somebody who is extraordinarily experienced, played a significant role in the European recovery program, one which for, for which I think he does deserve a place in the history books, but has a, a parliamentary whip um, in, in Rolf Mützenich, who would like to take the party security poli policy back to the 1980s. So honestly, I've, I have concerns about all of them. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think actually Laschet's um, foreign policy instincts do rather undermine the idea that he stands for stability, because stability in today's geopolitical environment, to me at least, does, doesn't feel like... the ability to adapt. Is the ability exactly. to, to, to adapt and to recognise reality, yeah. uh, which, which exactly. I would say Precisely. some of his comments yeah. would and suggest. And I'm quite concerned not. about that. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, um, Michel, what's your what's your view? Do do you do you think there is a real chance that you might end up with a left of centre led government? We can we can we can we can come on to the question of, where, of whether the SPD might catch up with the Greens or not. But you know, let's let's assume the 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 assumption is that the CDU would lead the next government. What do you think are the chances that it won't? It is what. what do you Chances that it won't, that the next government will be led from left of the centre? Well, uh, it's very hard to predict. Um, as I said, I think it's a situation that is really open. And the question is, will this be three months where people are lying at the beach and for, try to forget what happened in the last year and come, uh, come back and uh, just vote the status quo that they have always voted? Or is this mood for change still there? Yeah? And this can be influenced by campaigns. And I see uh, the most potential for change uh, in terms of numbers with Olaf Scholz. I agree with you that he, is, uh, he, he appears to be the Angela Merkel number two, and that was part of this, his strategy at first, that he thought, okay, I, I will just grasp all the conservative votes from Merkel that uh, uh, that are now not uh, that, that the CDU now cannot reach anymore, but he realized that this does not work and that he has to be more bold, more aggressive, 
and um, more emotional, you know. And so I don't know if he manages to change his style and his election campaign, but I think he, from all those three candidates, he has the most potential to increase his uh, popularity, and he, he already is uh, pretty popular. And I also see a gap in the market for him, because um, the, the Greens clearly stand for renewal, they have a fresh candidate, um, they, they uh, are very popular among the young, and they have a base, they know where they stand, they have a strategy. The, the SPD is a little bit more, has been a little bit more ambivalent in the past, and uh, I, I see one gap, and this, this gap that they should and could use is to offer a realistic plan for the transformation into the ecological age, the env environmental age. Realistic plan means to not only describe goals, but also describe ways of how to achieve goals. I'll give you one example. We, a couple of weeks ago, we increased the goals for the next decades of how much carbon dioxide we are allowed to use as a country. And now the, the federal regions are really upset because they don't know how to build enough power lines to get the um, electricity from the wind areas and sunny areas to the south. And so environmental policy is very complicated and has to do with good planning. And I think competence is an issue here, and if he plays this card intelligently, I think he can convince some. Just very briefly, do you, do you see voters voting on, actually voting on the environment when it comes down to it? Because I know a lot of them will tell pollsters, I care terribly about the environment. But, I mean, if that's the case, then Laschet, who does not have a great record on the environment, might be seen to be in trouble. Do you think people will actually end up voting on those subjects? I was skeptical a long time, but since it has been steadily polling so hard and so, ha so high, I'm convinced it's, it's one of the main issues, yes. And no party can afford not to talk about it. And the second uh, um, um, point I would like to make is you have to have a climate policy that is socially just, you know, and that's also a, a point that Olaf Scholz can make more strongly than now. But I would also like to talk, if we're uh, going to move to this subject, which of the possible coalition scenarios is realistic? Should we come to this question? Because I find this uh, particularly interesting. But uh, Yeah, that's, that's exactly where I wanted to go next. I want to also briefly remind those watching that you can uh, send in your questions, which we'll get to. We've got a couple of really good ones come in. So I want to come to those soon. But just a couple of quick things I want to get through first. The first is just some reflections on two of the possible coalitions that are, are talked about, as you say, Constance, the numbers might suggest that we're going in the direction of a three-party a three government, which of course would be a first at German federal level. And in fact, the two, <clears throat> the two governments uh, spoken of, or the two f combinations of parties spoken of, are, but would both be a first um, a, a, a federal level. There's, there is, the, as you say, the, the traffic light, so uh, uh, the Social Democrats, the Greens and the Liberals in some combination, um, or Jamaica, so the Christian Democrats, the Greens, and, and the Liberals. And we've seen both of those at a state level in one or two places, but never before at a federal level. Just briefly from both of you, perhaps starting with Constanza, could we just hear any thoughts on, on whether, how likely you think it is that, that those, one or both of those would work? Because that's, in both cases, you're talking a wide range of different political instincts and traditions, some obvious areas of disagreement. Um, any reflections on those two possibilities, traffic light and, and Jamaica, as, as, as viable f models for German government? Well, the, the, I think the irony here is, is this, that based on um, political views and party programs and the preferences of the base, any of these ought to be extremely complicated, right? Um, because those are quite far apart on... Uh, the economy, on climate issues, on foreign and security policy, um, domestic issues, you name it. There, there would be a lot of things to discuss in a coalition agreement. However, uh, the Liberals are in a bind because they walked out of Jamaica 
four years ago after three months of negotiations. Um, and I think they are now on probation for good behavior. So I think their, their room for, their room for tantrums, um, is, is distinctly limited by this experience, which, uh, the scars of which their co-negotiators in the other party still bear. I think there are real grudges there from those coalition knights and the, and the walkout by, by Christian Lindner. So it, in the, it, so anybody who negotiates with the liberals will know the liberals are desperate to be back in power um, for the first time since, since the, uh, really since reunification. And um, so that would be in terms of power politics, a little easier than before. The Greens, likewise, are desperate to be back in, um, in, in federal government again. They've been in a federal government before as the junior partner in uh, 1998 when they took over under Chancellor Schroeder from Helmut Kohl at the height of the Kosovo air war. Um, and of course, they're still hoping for the option of a green, of a green chancellor. So again, I think the Greens would also be, uh, you know, have have demonstrated by their in, in their campaign just how disciplined they're willing to be. And but 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 we've also seen, I think, in this discussion about uh, um, Annalena Baerbock's uh, CV, uh, a little bit of slippage of discipline. And and that that was a case where they'd clearly missed a trick. And I was part of a uh, foreign and security policy working group uh, called uh, More Ambition, Please, which was organized by the GMF, which I used to run in Berlin, and uh, the Heinrich Böll Foundation, a paper that was published in January and um, contained a rather full-throated commitment to the to nuclear participation by Germany. And the left wing of the Greens on publication of that paper reacted as though they'd collectively been stung by a tarantula. Um, we saw Jürgen Trittin, Agnieszka Brucker, and others going public. Um, and uh, I, I gather that uh, the head of the Bell Foundation um, got a lot of uh, criticism from the party base, um, from, from uh, students, uh, regional groupings, et cetera, et cetera. So I think, you know, never ever underestimate the, uh, the ability of the left wing of the Greens and of the sort of yeasty party base to make trouble when they feel like it. Um, and presumably they will feel like it if they think that, that their bosses are going to get anywhere near power. Um, and with the Social Democrats, I would just say, you know, the, I think that the Social Democrats have been both exceedingly disciplined and responsible in not just two, Michael, but three uh, grand coalitions with, with yes. uh, Angela Merkel. Uh, I think they've actually done really good work in power in in the briefs that they've had whether it was environment or or, or finance um they've had some really important jobs and i think they did them well labor ministry as well but at the same time they have a they they have a left wing that has been dreaming of a, a, a center-left coalition with die linke something i think that die linke itself is basically uh, has undermined so completely that that is a non-option but that left wing is still there and in coalition negotiations will will want to be satisfied. And it has some very distinct views on foreign and security policy. As I was saying earlier, nuclear participation is one of them. They want to get out of that. They don't like armed drones. Um, and there are a number of other issues that I think they would have very strong views on. So I would expect um, difficult, protracted coalition negotiations um, that would be um, anything but predictable. Yeah. Absolutely, I think, I think, and I think that instance, that instance with the uh, the, the paper that you mentioned was a, a very interesting look into some of the, the strains you might see in coalition talks, let alone in actually such a government. Michelle, you're, 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 you've got a front Absolutely. row seat, indeed, exactly. You've got a, you've got a front row seat for this, you know, in the Bundestag. Do you ever kind of look at some of the parties that are talked of as being members of a, of a single of a single coalition after election and think, how on earth are these people going to work together? Well. Uh, yes, and uh, especially if you bear in mind that the Green Parliamentary Group uh, in the next uh, term will be much bigger than today, probably. So there's going to be a lot of people that uh, will be in the Bundestag for the first time, and it will be hard to hold them together. And uh, I, also, I already mentioned the big polarization of the parliamentary group of the CDU especially. 
Um, so that's going to be, a, I think, a very, very big task to hold those two together. That's why I would like to warn a little bit um, that a conservative Green coalition, in, on my opinion, will really be a tough ride. I know it has been prepared by some of both sides. I know that many journalists and media uh, like the idea because it's a fascinating um, possibility that's new. But I think uh, at the end of the day, the Greens, especially the Greens, would suffer tremendously because they are out with a clear message of change and the CDU, CSU in, in their current state will not be able to allow them a radical transformation of the German model. We've also seen how difficult it is for junior coalition partners. I mean, the SPD has proven yeah. that, that you can you can push through all sorts of great ideas, but you very rarely get thanked for it by the German electorate. And I mean, I can absolutely see why, as Constanza says, the Greens will go for the Chancellery if they possibly can, because it's just you know you, you, it, it's not it's not it's not like being number two, but slightly more so. It's 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 fundamentally different. And yeah, yeah. And and also just imagine uh, European policies. The Greens want to. Um, to, to, um, to, to allow the EU to borrow money, not just for the recovery fund, but also in the long term. You know? This is one of the main European policy uh, proposals, which will not be possible with uh, the Conservatives, definitely not. But there's also one argument against this coalition, that's uh, an argument, a gen more general argument. I would argue that it would be a coalition of the bourgeoisie, you know, it would be the what we call Bürgertum, you know, the, 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 the older citizens, the, the uh, uh, wealthy citizens, affluent people and their children that have gr grown up. Some of them have grown up now and uh, they will leave out 50 percent of the population. I know that the Greens have a very left program, but I'm talking about who is represented and both the Greens and the uh, CDU are, uh, or the Greens even more, are a very academic, uh, elite-oriented uh, party. And so that's really a, a big problem, I think, f uh, in the long term, if you have such a coalition. Mm. Yeah. yeah, traffic light coalition. Should we discuss that as well? Just, just, just any brief thoughts on that from, 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 from within the Bundestag? Because I'd like to get on to one final thing before yeah. we go to questions. Do you, do, do you think that would work? Um, Which one? Uh, the traffic light coalition. Mm. I don't know. But in preparation of, of this talk, I thought about it a little bit uh, longer and um, I found some arguments in favor of it, if the numbers uh, enable such a coalition. Um, of course, uh, SPD and Greens are natural partners. They have the most programmatic proximity and it will not be very hard to find compromises, I think. The problem here is the liberal FDP. But I would argue that for the FDP, it could be a very interesting option to develop, to reinvent itself as something like a modern, state-of-the-art liberal party, also open for migrants and younger people. I think this migrant idea is especially interesting for the FDP because in this coalition I think one of the claims should be uh, to um, create an open society. And the FDP at the moment, you know, they, they, they have some tendencies sometimes to try to grasp voters from the AFD and they completely neglect that they have a big potential with the migrant population because the migrant population, they are basically liberal because they work in small shops that they themselves own. Um, a lot of them are self-employed and so on. You, you know, you, you just go on the streets and look who owns the stores, the shops. That's, that's the classic clientele of a liberal, economically liberal party. And my proposal would be that this traffic light, or my suggestion would be that this traffic light uh, coalition could come up with certain projects that both parties could agree upon. So you would have a social democratic strain, a green strain and a liberal strain. They could agree on innovation, innovating the economy, innovating the social system. They could agree on preventive policies, preventive social policies and equality of opportunity right away. 
They could agree on uh, pushing forward an active state, an active state not meaning necessarily a large state, but a powerful state, a state that is able to, to act. I already mentioned open society uh, and defending liberal democracy. And last but not least, uh, civic rights. That's also a, a big thing that both of them um, have in their program. So I think it's, it's, it could be realistic. It seems to me that with any of these possibilities, the question is, do the differences of the, between the parties simply cancel each other out so they don't get much done and or cause, cause uh, disagreements and, and uh, turmoil? Or do they say, we agreed to disagree on these things and we're each going to try yes. and put forward our best foot and, and, and bring what we can? And I think that actually also applies to J Jamaica too. You can imagine each party bringing strengths to that that would make a strong whole, but it's also possible imagine, to imagine them just arguing. Um, um, Constance, it would be interesting to have your thoughts on that, but I'd like if you could possibly bundle them with, with uh, an answer to my... The final question I wanted to get to in the sort of discussion part of this before we go to the questions, which is a big one. Um, what should the next Chancellor, he or she, when they walk into the office vacated with, uh, from, by, by Angela Merkel um, uh, when her, her, her furniture and things have been removed and it's the first day and they walk in there, what should be their top three priorities, would you say, whether it's domestic or foreign? What would be the biggest items on their agenda on that first day? Um, Constanza, I, I don't know if you wanted to come in on the traffic light point, um, but anyway, if you could um, give, us, give us your thoughts on that. Well, I, I, I did just want to note that if, um, you know, if we've got... I, I'm, not, I'm not sure that, you know, Germany's bourgeoisie... Um, and that's a term that I haven't really heard since my student days. Um, I know. Isn't it's not, it's quite an aspirational... Well, I mean, I, I think that that's an aspiration that continues to exist in Germany. And I would, I would just also say that if you're concerned about being seen as, you know, about, about the bourgeoisie, then perhaps I would choose a different kind of apartment to have this conversation in. Um, I mean, it does sort of look very, you know, that, that does look like a very upper middle class apartment by, by Berlin standards. And, and, the, and the wall colouring is positively Pharaoh and Ball. But anyway, um, I will... <laughs> Good point. Touché. Touché. <laughs> <laughs> well, we don't wear trousers, so... <laughs> yes. Yeah, I don't, know, I don't know where the trousers are. Well, situation shorts, us, not no trousers. <laughs> exactly, thank you. Shorts. Yeah. Moving swiftly on, Constanza. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> moving swiftly on, as they say, exactly. Um, look, I think I think the the next chancellor um, won't have anything to remove from Angela Merkel. Um, remember that Angela Merkel um, arrived in her in her office and saw this enormous desk that Gerhard Schröder's architect uh, had specially constructed for him at. Uh, Gerhard Schroeder's behest and uh, has been using it as a depository of, of stacks of books and papers ever since. And I think she works at a small sort of corner table in, in that same office. I, I doubt that Angela Merkel's move will you know, involve significant lifting of furniture. Um, and I, th I also think, to be, to be serious now, that the next chancellor doesn't have the luxury of choosing priorities really. The country is in a state of um, delayed transformation on so many issues, from domestic resilience to the economy, uh, to foreign and security policy, that the next chancellor's task and the next coalition's task is going to be doing all these things at the same time. And I have to say, I've been most impressed by how the Biden administration went to work here. Um, they had clearly spent nearly a year working in, in, in large working groups, devising their policies, devising action plans. And I can only pray that the German parties are doing something similar. If so, I haven't really heard about it. Um, I frankly, I, my, my concern really is that we do not have the luxury as a country in the middle of Europe, as the anchor economy and as the point that um, external aggressors think is the Archimedean point of the, of, of the alliance and of the European Union. We do not have the luxury of introversion and of wasting time. 
particularly given the challenge of the French election in the spring of 2022, where Marine Le Pen is polling neck to neck with, with Macron and, and they are the only two candidates left standing. We, we just do not have the option of, of faffing around until like, like we did in 2017. And that's my most important point. So professionalism, yeah. uh, preparation, and just getting on with it, I think are the order of the day. Absolutely. And you, you just don't know when the next crisis is going to come. I mean, whether we're talking about the pandemic or we've also seen in the Merkel era how external events can, can, can blow a government onto a different course. And so I, I think moving ahead quickly with the long term stuff as fast as possible is, is essential. Uh, Michel, what do you think? I mean, what, what, maybe kind of um, zooming in a bit on some of those areas. There's this great need for modernization. There are these issues that have been delayed or parked under the Merkel era. What needs, what needs to be confronted first and most urgently? Yeah, I mean, my first point would be I would suggest a, a program or a big initiative for burden sharing uh, after Corona, um, because of all the debt that has been produced in the last two years. I think we have to come up with a plan: who's going to pay the bill, who's going to pay more, and this must include a, a bold tax reform where probably the wealthy need to pay more than now, and if it's possible the um, lower paid uh, should pay less. So that's that burden sharing um, argument uh, would be the first one. The second one is I would suggest some kind of a big program for social cohesion or a big initiative for social cohesion. So something that uh, encompasses the attempt to uh, unleash the forces in society to become more solitaristic, to work together more closely and so on. So what I'm thinking about is like uh, money for neighborhood centers where people can meet even in rural areas where sometimes, you know, in little towns you don't have a place to, um, to come together. Uh, money for train stations. We have 10,000 train stations in Germany and only a uh, few of them actually have people working there and you could um, develop many of those train stations into uh, centers where you can buy stuff, meet yourself, meet people and so on. Um, and I also f still find it a very interesting topic um, to think about something like a um, uh, initiative to um, make young people voluntar or to, not, not voluntarily, to, to um, in, in an initiative where young people work in a social area for one year, like a, a common year, such as we used to have as the, what we call civil service. I don't know that how, how you would call it in, in, in English. And um, of course, then the biggest, the biggest challenge uh, will be the transformation of the economic and ecological model that we have. And you should uh, start making plans on how you have to rebuild, uh, the, the, build the infrastructure to make it possible and rebuild the economy. And yeah, a lot of, a lot of stuff ahead for the next chancellors. Not going to be an easy ride. Super. That's, that's very useful and that takes us nicely into, I think, our Q&A session, which we'll get going with now. So this is the end of the podcast section of the, the discussion. We'll put this out, as I say, on World Review, the New Statesman's World Affairs podcast. Um, and the next section on the, the Q&A will, will, will not be included. Um, so thank you for that. And on to the questions. Um, uh, we've got several really good ones. Uh, first of all, Holland Goltz asks through the chat, um, don't you see the vital issue of the post-Merkel era as being the strengthening of the EU? It's no longer a question of one country in Europe, such as Germany, but a question that we get majority decisions through in the EU and that the European Parliament elects the European Commission. This is the vital question of the next years, much more than which government runs Germany after, after September, writes, uh, 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 sorry, Ronald. Um, any thoughts on that, um, Constanza? On obviously, obviously, our questioner here is pushing at a sort of you know a new federal step for the for, for the EU. So thoughts on that, but also the the European agenda for the next government, because we've we've only touched on that a little. Uh, honestly, I think that I don't see. But let me put it this way: I, I think there are there is movement afoot on a variety of fronts 
for changing the way things are done in the European Union. And let's just let's just begin with the European Recovery Programme, which is as yet unfinished and, and I think politically undigested. Um, and given the fact that the Commission has just said that it's going to open proceedings against Germany for a judgment of the con uh, German Constitutional Court, on uh, bond buying by the ECB, um, you know we're we're not out of the of the woods at all on on the on the on the eurozone um, governance questions, uh, and I think those might remain front and center. Um, at the same time, the German Foreign Ministry is uh, making increasingly agitated noises about uh, QMB qualified majority voting. Uh, mainly because the Hungarians keep putting in vetoes, although notably they didn't put in a veto on sanctions against Belarus for the downing of that civilian airliner in, in, in late May, um, which I can, I can only say they bloody well, um, you know, the, the, I mean, that, that really, I think, would have been the end of it if, if they had. But the Hungarians like to put in vetoes generally, and particularly if that pleases China, and that is a problem. So I think we can expect a question about QMV, but I would also expect that to raise significant tensions within the European Union. Um, I think enlargement is still on the docket, um, but highly problematic given the enormous influence, not just of Russia, um, but of uh, Turkey, uh, Saudi Arabia and others in, in the Western Balkans. Um, that's that's li likely to remain conflictual. And so I don't really see, given all these, uh, you know, seemingly, um, you know, familiar, but, but sort of very complex and very divisive issues that are already on the docket, I don't see anybody seriously undertaking um, a major step towards deeper integration. I th uh, also because I think that that would just increase the political tensions at a time when the European project is genuinely being interfered with massively by external adversaries. Yeah, and I mean, I suppose a related question is, uh, do you think the next government will actually invest the energy in those priorities? Because you know, of the three conceivable chancellors, Laschet, Scholz and Baerbock, they're all self-professed keen Europeans. Um, and they all have policies that would be that would put them very much on the, the pro-European end of politics in many European countries. Right. Um, but, but then one I, wonders, I one wonders that, if they'll really focus on that. Yes, uh, I, I suspect not. And I, I think that they would have quite a lot of work to do to repair some of the damage done by the Merkel coalition um, on, on, on European cohesion by, for example, the Nord Stream 2 project which if there is a green chancellor, there's you know, going to be a fight about. And there I think lie the, I think the main responsibility of the next chancellor will be in trying to forge European cohesion, um, patch over the divisions that have arisen in the past, make sure that the Euro European recovery program comes to fruition, is processed, works. Um, and I think also, you know, the, the, the issue of climate change, which, as Michael said correctly, um, is becoming more and more salient for particularly for younger voter groups, but not just younger voter groups. Um, factoring that in uh, into social and economic policies across the union is also going to be, um, you know, potentially quite conflictual, particularly in, in the poorer uh, periphery economies of Europe who, who might be inclined to think of this as something of a, uh, a diktat from Berlin, you know, a luxury problem, you know, if they've got high youth unemployment. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think managing all that will be the key European task of, of the next German Chancellor. Just also, may I just add one thing? I think that, I think that the, I think that preserving representative democracy in Europe, particularly in Hungary, and but also to some degree in Poland, um, is going to become an even greater concern than, than it is now and will, will require significant attention. Right. No, ab ab absolutely. Just one quick follow-up question and I'll come to Michelle on this. Um, 
the uh, director of the Centre for European Reform, Charles Grant, wrote the other week that, that, that Macron, assuming he, if he is re-elected next year, will, be, will take over from Merkel as the preeminent leader in Europe, um, irrespective, as I think he, he was arguing, of the outcome of the election and the coalition talks here. Do you agree with that, uh, briefly? Well, yes and no. I mean, he's clearly got um, enormous ambitions for Europe. He's got, as has been, you know, repeatedly observed, the the mind of a think tanker, which presumably for the three of us is a good thing. I'm not sure it is for that many other people. But I mean, he's he's certainly not deficient um, on on what what I think Helmut Schmidt used to call the vision thing. Um, but the I worry, I worry in his case, I worry about political execution. I think he is far less gifted in political execution. And I found his interventions on, uh, particularly on Russia, quite disconcerting um, and on NATO. Remember, he called NATO brain dead and argued for a Russia reset at a time when the Russians were really being extremely aggressive in Eastern Europe. I don't think the Eastern Europeans have forgotten that. Um, are unlikely to do so anytime soon. And I think that that will put a damper on any sort of aspirations of his to, to speak for Europe. Mm. And there's also the flip side of that Schmidt quote, which is, if you have visions, you need to go to the optician. Yes, so, um, yes I was Michelle, leaving it to you. <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, Michelle, <laughs> could, could, could we have, could we have um, some thoughts from, from you on this? I mean, how, how, first of all, do you agree on that point about the EU not necessarily being a big priority for the next chancellor when there are other when there are domestic concerns to deal with. Do you think that's true? And I mean, how do you see um, European policy fitting into the, for example, a traffic light coalition, um, as you were discussing earlier? Well, that's a, that's the hardest one. Uh, I might admit that. Um, well, you know, um, I believe that uh, the last coalition is a good example on. When you, remember the coalition treaty, the title of the treaty was something like building a strong Europe or something like that. And uh, it took almost three years, I think, until the first real initiatives came to the fore. The uh, unemployment insurance, which then resulted in SURE, yeah, as a smaller uh, program, but with a similar structure. And of course, the crisis, that then led to the recovery fund, which is a, some sort of revolution and might change the institutional landscape of Europe in a way. So it shows me that probably, especially when you are a new candidate, a new chancellor that has not been in office yet, it is very hard to uh, come up with new European strategies and projects. So that's why I uh, if I analyze this objectively, I would probably agree with Constanza that um, we should be realistic and modest and humble on the future steps of, of Europe and focus on the projects that are realistic. So, you know, uh, look at the structures that are there. The only, and, 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 and develop them. The only thing that I cannot assess, and I'm, I would be curious to uh, hear Constanza's view on this, is the um, Conference on the Future of Europe, which is an ambitious project. And uh, as I understood it, uh, all institutions are involved and um, national parliaments are involved, um, national regions are involved, and uh, they are the, the, the people that are um, uh, taking part on this of this conference are very serious and keen about it. Uh, do you think this will, uh, uh, if they agree on a plan for restructuring Europe, do you think this uh, would have a uh, realistic chance to get implemented, at least partly? Because it is illegitimate, because it is, has a certain legitimacy? Well, to be honest, I, I haven't been following it that closely because there is an awful lot going on in my remit otherwise. Um, that is, uh, you know, a couple summits this week for the G7 NATO, uh, the Biden-Putin summit. Um, and there's actually still quite a lot going on in this country. The fight for, um, for the future of American democracy is not over. Yeah, and we'll again, as the election results, <laughs> yeah, and at the, as the election results in Sachsen-Anhalt showed, it's not over in Germany either. So frankly, um, you know, if, if 
any of those go go wrong, um, I think the question of the future of Europe is moot. Um, yeah. In other words, I'm I'm you know I, I don't want to I, I don't want to be dismissive of this. I I think that it's important to to think ahead uh, over the horizon, but I don't see the political energy. I don't see the political mandate to turn this into structural change at a point when our uh, European nation states have some very serious structural deficiencies that need to be repaired. Well, that actually quite and again, I don't think it's an either or, either or choice, but but I do think that um, if you want if you want not to give uh, air to the populace, I think you you sort of need to pay attention closer to home at this point. That, that neatly answers one of the questions that just came in, which is from Paul Lim, who asks, um, in the context of the, of, the, of the recovery, is this an opportunity for Germany to lead the push of the furtherance of a federal Europe? But I think, I think we've, 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 we've covered that fairly well, although if either of you want to come in with any more, then please do so. So we have one question for each of you, and then we'll, we'll, we'll round that off. Um, so I will start with one for Constanza, which comes from Susanna Herrmann, who asks, what impact will Merkel's departure mean for Germany on the global stage? Would Germany be perceived differently with Chancellor Scholz or Baerbock? And does Baerbock have the potential to be the next Jacinda Ardern? So that's been directed <laughs> at you. <laughs> oh my, oh my. Well, um, look, I mean, I think people in Germany um, don't often understand just how much uh, weight and respect Angela Merkel has in other countries. Um, so the next chancellor has quite a lot to live up to. And the, I think part of that is due to the fact that she just over time uh, became such an extraordinarily um, skillful power operator. Now, she also had no international experience when she started. She learned on the job. But I think that she had one significant advantage over as, a, as an East German physicist over her West German conservative competitors, which is a total lack of a sense of entitlement. And um, might I just say that um, I occasionally get the impression, um, particularly in certain regions of the CDU, and if I hope I'm not being unkind here if I say this, it seems to me to apply particularly to the male pretenders, um, that that sense of entitlement remains alive and well, and I think is more of an impediment to actually attaining power than, than those folks understand. So I think a certain degree of, you know, lack of assumptions that one, you know, that one is now in line for power um, is actually quite helpful at home and abroad. And honestly, I think, I think that on that count at least, Baerbock has the better chances of garnering respect. Um, but again, that's offset by her distinct lack of experience. I would, look, much as I like her, I respect her, I would have quite liked her to gain another decade of experience, frankly, before hitting that particular point. And I do worry that she, you know, might be burning her, her considerable talents and ambition um, uh, at, the, at this point. Yeah, and one wonders if, if the best thing for her might actually yeah. be a black green government where she has a big ministerial job and then is lined, Precisely. lined up to, yes. be, to be Well, chancellor. in somewhat, you know, and, and I think that, that Annegret Kamkamba is, is an instructive example. Annegret Kamp Kamp Karenbau had uh, the energy, the ambition uh, to run for party leadership, be the pretender to Merkel and, and do the defense ministry at the same time, stumbled over her lack of experience as, a, as party leader, and then stepped down, I think quite gracefully, and, and is now doing a surprisingly good job as a defense minister, where indeed she has, as from what I know, earned the respect and, and, the, and the admiration of a lot of her NATO peers. Um, and I think that that would, might be an interesting example. And mm. whereas for, for Schultz and, and Laschet, they are nothing if not known quantities. 
Yeah, they are nothing if not predictable. I do sort of worry about, um, to quote a very famous film, um, uh, Kind Hearts and Coronets, Jeremy, you may know it, uh, somewhat lacking in sparkle and perhaps somewhat lacking in, in imagination, uh, the kind of imagination that is necessary to lead on an international stage. And so there I would, uh, you know, I think they'd have a learning curve. I don't think they're incapable of doing it, but based on, on sort of current, um, current experience, you know, I hope to be pleasantly surprised, let me put it that way. And I think that's one of the most important things to pay attention to for anyone who's sort of watching the German election over the next month. That's, that's absolutely central. We're running very short of time, so we have a final question. And if you could both answer, the organisers have asked me to ask you to reply in two sentences. So that's, that's coming, from, coming from above. And the question is, what should be the number one priority of the next German government to make the 2020s a progressive decade? So just a quick... Um, you, you know what, I'm, I hogged the airwaves just now, so I'm going to leave that to Michael. I'm good, okay, thanks. thank you. Over to you, Michael. Um, can I think about it for five seconds? <laughs> the biggest question of all, the biggest question of all. Well, I think, as I said... The number one priority is the, is the, the wording. The number one priority for the next German government is or will be to unleash the potential of the society itself to rebuild after Corona and uh, to implement, a policy, po implement policies of social cohesion and solidarity. You've managed it in one sentence. Brilliant. Thank you very much for that. And that's a good point on which to end, I think. I'd like to thank you both very much for that conversation. Really enjoyed it. Um, Constance Schelzer Müller, Fritz, Fritz, Fritz Stern Chair sorry, on Germany and Transatlantic <laughs> Relations at Brookings. Uh, Michael Miebach, the Chair and Co-Founder of Das Progressive Zentrum. I've been Jeremy Cliff, International Editor of The New Statesman. Thank you very much for joining us. Lovely to talk to you, boys. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs> Cheers. Bye -bye. Cheers.